The religions of this world say, do, do, do. The gospel of the grace of God says, it's done. That's some of the great wisdom that our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, shares with us today on Through the Bible. I'm Steve Schwetz, your host, welcoming you aboard the Bible bus as we set off for another great adventure in God's Word. Before we begin our study in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, let's welcome Through the Bible's President Greg Harris, who's here to update us on a topic that's, well, Really close to home. It is, Steve. In fact, it's as close as this office and, and the United States and Canada. It's really about our relationships here in North America. You know, I often come in here and I love to talk about the global ministry, but the truth is that without our domestic stations, our domestic partnerships, the ministry connections we have, we would have no global ministry. Yeah, and I especially think, as you mentioned, the radio stations that are out there that have supported us and allowed us to be on prime time slots yes. uh, in their local markets and have, as the as the ministry was being born and growing across the country, um, calling and asking for it to be put on to those stations and the the vital role that they played early on in this ministry yes. and the role they continue to play today because although radio some people have said you know is a diminishing market as people go more towards digital mm-hmm. and offline types of things our number one source of support and our number one outreach still comes through the medium of radio yeah and steve one of the things i hear from station managers station owners is we have had through the Bible since day one when we yeah. opened the doors of this radio station. And although uh, that is just so wonderful, there's there's something important in that because, you know, Dr. McGee passed away almost three decades ago. Mm-hmm. And there was some pressure, particularly in those early days, for right. people to say, you know, don't keep him on the air. Yeah, He's no longer here. shut the doors, here. right? Yeah. And, and people have defended him because of the content and the value of this ministry. And Steve, although it's impossible for us to name all the different stations we're on, because we're on 1,200 stations across North Multiple America. Multiple times a day on those yes, stations. Yes, exactly. Um, just a huge number of releases. We are grateful for the independent stations, the the, the small operations where people just yeah. faithfully are serving their community, all the way up to the bigger networks like right. Salem Radio, right. um, Crawford Broadcasting, wonderful people to work with, BBN, uh, just such a great partner in ministry. Um, and KHCB, just some of the networks. We can't name them all, but one of the things we want to encourage you to do is if you're blessed by Through the Bible, it's great to let us know, but also yeah. let your local station know because we need yeah. them. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and it was so nice at this year's Christmas party to be reminded of all of the ministry partners yes. uh, that have been a part of Through the Bible over the years. Many of them uh, did a brief uh, video congratulations yes. blurb. And if you would like to go see that, what we saw at our Christmas party, go to ttb.org forward slash about us. You'll see people like Chuck Swindoll and Johnny Erickson Tata yeah. and many others uh, saying what uh, congratulations to 50 years of broadcasting and oftentimes what impact uh, the ministry has had on their lives. Yeah, it was really encouraging to see that. And I think that uh, everybody would enjoy uh, hearing the stories and, and just seeing the enthusiasm people have for uh, through the Bible. Now, just another highlight I'd like to make of our U.S. ministry, and that's something you're a part of, a ministry you're a part of, which is our board of directors. Yes. And we don't talk a lot about the board, but they are extremely important in helping guide the ministry spiritually, praying for the ministry, uh, giving me advice and input as I talk about the new initiatives that God is leading us in. And just maybe you could say a word as a board member of the, the ways that our listeners can pray for our board. Well, I think the number one way that you could pray for us is for wisdom and discernment in knowing, um, you know, as Greg brings different opportunities for us to explore, that there would be unanimity mm-hmm. uh, on the board. Yes. And w- that is one thing that those of you listening have ever been a part of a board where it just doesn't work and there's conflict. Mm-hmm. We have, uh, as long as I've been on the board, never had that situation. Right. And yeah. we've always had uh, a great working relationship. So pray that God would protect that, that it would continue on. And then pray for, I'm thinking about the future. You know, what happens in the next 20 or 30 years? Mm -hmm. Be praying that God would bring the right uh, men and possibly women to the board in the future uh, to be able to serve in the ministry. 
Yes, and Steve, I would agree with what you have shared about the unity and the unanimity. It doesn't mean we don't have some pretty robust debates. Even you and I sometimes yes, uh, we have will been take on the different opposite views, sides of but we issues. respect each other and right. we love each other. And and at the right. end of the day, if we're not in a unanimous, uh, united togetherness, we don't move forward and we right. wait. So it really is an important part of our ministry that we need you to pray for. Yeah. So, Greg, since we're on the subject of prayer, why don't I do that as we begin our study in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Heavenly Father, we pray right now for the broadcast that will be sent out today, that uh, people would be blessed by it, that you even today would cause people to turn to Christ as a result of the words that they hear from Dr. McGee. I pray that you would continue to have your hand of protection on this ministry, particularly for the board uh, that you would give us wisdom and discernment and unanimity as we move forward in seeking to get the whole word to the whole world. All to your glory and honor. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Now we have here, as we come today to this fourth chapter, another segment of God's comfort. We've had in chapter 1, God's comfort for life's plans. Then in chapter 2, God's comfort in restoring a sinning saint. Then in chapter 3, God's comfort in the glorious ministry of Christ. Wasn't that third chapter wonderful? Well, we're not going to come down from the mount. We're going to stay right up there because now we have God's comfort in the ministry of suffering for Christ. I'm not sure about what we'll have to climb a little higher. And I'm not sure about what we're getting in an atmosphere where I have really difficulty in breathing. But let's go on up. He says, come up higher. And that's what we want to do. Now, verse 1 of chapter 4, I want to read. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. Now, this is the ministry here, he says. This is a glorious ministry. The ministry that he's given to us today is a ministry that no man could have worked it out. It'd just be impossible for him to work it out. And I do not know why he let me in on it other than this. Because Paul says, as we've received mercy. And as we said before, that God's rich in mercy. and He didn't exhaust it before he got to me and because he saw I'd need a whole lot of it. And he's been rich in mercy to me. And by mercy, he's permitted me to have this radio program. I can assure you that's the reason for it. And because of that, we faint not. We're rejoicing today. Someone got the impression the other day because I just made the statement that our program was unique, that I was lonely. My friend, I have never enjoyed the ministry as I have since I retired. And my wife says to me, if this is retirement, it's for the birds. She said, we've never been so busy in our lives. Oh, thank God, friend. In fact, the matter is my doctor made me slow down, and this body of mine just won't keep up with me anymore. And I saw it wasn't, and so I've slowed down a little, I can assure you. Now, listen to Paul. He says this ministry is wonderful. Well, what's so wonderful about it? Well, I'll tell you what's wonderful about it is this. I studied religions in seminary, and fact of the matter is they so fascinated me that in the first few years of my ministry, I almost went in that direction to specialize in that particular field, but I didn't. But I am more or less acquainted with quite a few religions in this world. And if you want to know the difference between Christianity or the gospel of the grace of God and the religions of the world, it can be expressed in one word. All of them say, Do, do, do. And the gospel says, done. D-O-N-E, done. The gospel says, God has done something for me. And I'm to believe it. I'm to trust him. And that's my approach to him. The only way I can come to him, by faith. And without faith, it's impossible to please him. But the religions of this world, oh, they all say do. And I've been rather amused. I've taken the cults of this country. I did this years ago. One of them says the four things you have to do to be saved. I disagree with them on every one of them. They do say faith, but their faith isn't a trust in Christ. It's anything but that. It just means that you believe 
that Christ died 1,900 years ago is a historical fact. Well, you just well believe George Washington crossed the Delaware, or the Potomac. It was the Delaware, wasn't it? May I say to you, that won't save you. But just to believe Jesus died, my friend, Jesus died for our sin, according to the Scripture. Oh, how important that is. It's all important, my friend. So all of the religions of the world, they say, come on, do something, boy. And one of them has seven things you must do. And another one has ten things you must do, the Ten Commandments. May I say to you, they don't recognize they are not doing it, but nevertheless, they have all of that. Now, Paul at one time had been under the law. He knew what it was, but he could say very candidly. He says, I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Others may think they were really under the law. I was under it. And he says, I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. And he hoped that he'd be able to work out his salvation. And then one day he met the Lord Jesus Christ on the Damascus Road, and he came to know him. And when he came to know him, he says that I might be found in him not having mine own righteousness. You see, when Paul stood in the presence of Jesus Christ, he saw that Paul couldn't make it on his own. He'd have to have the righteousness of Christ. Might be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but the righteousness which is by faith of Jesus Christ. And Paul says... Now, that was a new day for him. That's a new day for all of us. Now, we need mercy. And God has been merciful. The love of God provided a Savior. God loved us. But God in mercy provided a Savior. And now he saves us by his grace. How wonderful he is. Now, Paul's not through. He's going to say something else. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Now, Paul says that there's something else, not for salvation. No, you're saved by the grace of God. But Paul says that great emphasis should be put on living the gospel. We've renounced, he says, the hidden things of dishonesty. You see, the fact that we've come to Christ and trusted him, it's not just that intellectual ascent that Christ died on the cross. It's that we trust him. And not only that we've trusted him, but we've been regenerated. That he now has saved us, and we ought to be an example of the gospel. In other words... The man who preaches the gospel should be a holy man. And he says here, we've renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. Well, last time, probably you thought I was not very kind to the Amplified Bible. Well, I'm going to turn and read it today, this verse, because the translation here is very good. It brings out all the facets of these words that Paul uses. Let me read now verse 2. In the Amplified Bible, you follow along in your Bible there. We have renounced disgraceful ways, secret thoughts, feelings, desires, and underhandedness, methods and arts that man hide through shame. We refuse to deal craftily, that is, to practice trickery and cunning, or to adulterate or handle dishonestly the Word of God. But we state the truth openly, clearly, and candidly. And so we commend ourselves in the sight and presence of God on every man's conscience. My friend, that's a very wonderful verse. Now, that gives meaning here. We are not to walk in hypocrisy. We shouldn't be unreal. Our behavior shouldn't contradict that which we are preaching. May I say it ought to be a conduct that meets the approval of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not perfect, but at least we ought to walk in a way that is well-pleasing to him. And we're not perfect. Then he has another word here, that not handling the word of God deceitfully. Someone has translated that huckstering, not huckstering the word of God. 
May I say to you, this gets right down to you. Mr. Preacher, many of you listen to me. Why do you preach? You're preaching for money? You say you preach for the love of souls, but really is it the love of souls or is it money? I better examine my own heart in this connection. May I say to you, Paul could say, Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. And therefore, you can preach the gospel and say things that are absolutely true. And then your life, it's speaking another message all the same time. Oh, I want to say to you, I pray about this a great deal in my own life. And I say, oh, God, don't let me preach unless I can have a clear conscience. Unless there is the power of the Spirit of God. I don't want to preach unless there's those two things. You know, it's glorious to preach the gospel, but it's an awful thing to preach it. And actually, down underneath, there is that lack of sincerity lack of being committed to it, uh, having a conviction about it. And may I say, I'm not just talking to preachers, because they've already tuned me out, but I'm talking to you, Christian friend. You want to be a witness for Christ? And you are a witness. Actually, what he's speaking of here as being the clergy or the ministry is not the man in the pulpit. It's the man in the pew. We today ought to train people for the work of the ministry, Paul says. That's our business. We ought to help equip you. But I'd like to say to you that it's very important for us to recognize that the Lord Jesus Christ, he died for the sheep, not for the shepherd. He died for the sheep. And it's the sheep that are going to win sheep. The shepherd doesn't produce sheep. Sheep produce sheep. You know, heard that the other day. That's tremendous. Shepherds can't produce sheep. My business is try to get you to witness. And by the way, are you doing something today to get the Word of God out? That's witnessing. God may have given you a gift to make money, and you're helping somebody get it out. You may be a man or woman of prayer, or you may have contact with people nobody else could reach. They wouldn't listen to me. I find that some people, they say, my, I don't want to listen to that fellow with that. What was it? I read a letter the other day. This party listened to me and thought I had a twang. And they were about ready to turn me off. They laughed at my accent. And then they kept listening. And there's a professor back in the University of Ohio. He said, when I tuned you in, I thought you was a screamer from my section of the country. That is East Tennessee and West Virginia. But he says... I found out you didn't run out of breath. I kept waiting for you to, and you didn't. And that man came to the Lord. Now, I can't reach all of them, though. A lot of them tune me in, and then they tune me out. But you could reach them. God's called you to witness, my friend. This is tremendous. Now, we come to something else that is tremendous here. Will you listen? He says, but if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world... And actually, I don't like to call him the God of this world, Satan, because he's not. I go out into the woods this past fall. Ms. McGee and I had the privilege of driving through eastern Ohio and West Virginia and Pennsylvania and Maryland and around Virginia and crossing to Indiana and Illinois and Missouri and Arkansas. Oh, how beautiful it was. Now, I say to you, that's God's world that we were looking at. Oh, sin is marred, it, but still God's world. But it should be the God of this age. And Satan, my friend, is the God of this age. He's running it. He runs the United Nations. He runs all the amusements. And he's running the whole show today, if you ask me. And he's the God of this age. And what has he done? Well, he has blinded. He says here, He hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Now, this is a tremendous thing that we have here. Have you ever heard anybody say, Well, you know, I don't understand the gospel. I've heard it all my life, but it doesn't mean anything to me. You know, I've heard people say that again and again. What's happened? The devil is blinded. <laughs> the light is shining, but the devil is blinded. 
so you can't see. Just like that miner I told about up in West Virginia. He was down in the mine, and they'd had an explosion, and quite a few miners were trapped. And finally, they got food over to them, and then they got a light over to where they were trapped. And they turned on the light, and a young miner there, looking right into the light, says, Why don't they turn on the light? And all of the men looked at him startled. He'd been blinded, you see. Satan's blinded. And a lot of people say, Why don't you turn on the light? I don't see the gospel at all. Satan's blinded you, my friend, if that's your condition today. Now, there's others, though, that say this. You know, there are things in the Bible that I cannot believe. Now, I don't know why, but I just can't believe them. I had a letter the other day from a man. He wanted to challenge me that I was giving out a gospel that's not true, and I knew the Bible was not true. Oh, the arrogance. And In fact, I wrote him. I told him I've never read a letter where I've seen such a display of ignorance and arrogance. And this fellow, really my friend, was ignorant, and he was arrogant also. And you know what his problem was? His problem was that there were not things in the Bible he couldn't believe. There was sin in his life that the Bible condemned. He didn't want to believe it. And that's the condition of a lot of folk today. The problem is not with the Bible. The problem is with their lives. And my friend, if you want to go on indulging in your sin, then you can go on. But you're lost. But you can turn to Christ. Don't tell me you can't. You can. Paul, therefore, can say, we preach not ourselves. But Christ Jesus, the Lord, and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. My friend, it's only the Lord Jesus that can save you. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now, he goes back to the creation. And I don't know when creation took place. A great many folk think, those of us that are fundamentalists, that we believe that God created this universe in 4004 B.C. at 9.32 in the morning. My friend, may I say, that's about as asinine a viewpoint as I know anything about. I do not know any of my fundamental brethren that believe them. Way back yonder in the beginning, God created it. And I think in the ages or the past, and if you want billions of years, I say put them in. If you want trillions of years, put them in. If you need squillions of years, put them in, brother. Our God's a God of eternity. And he wasn't sitting around twiddling his thumbs waiting for man to appear on the scene. Man's a Johnny-come-lately, of course, but God's been here a long time. And this universe goes way back. I don't know what happened to it. Something happened to it. And it bears evidence of that. And finally, my friend, God moved in, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And then God said, let there be light. So God commanded the light to shine out of darkness, and it shined in our hearts. What happens is this. The Holy Spirit of God, and the word back there in the Greek in Genesis 1, is that the Spirit of God brooded. And the Spirit of God brings conviction to us. And then he regenerates us. And the light of the glorious gospel shines in our hearts in the face of Jesus Christ. And we're back looking at him again. Someone has said, the look saves, but the gaze sanctifies. And we need to spend a lot of time looking at it. But even at best, we're told we have this treasure in earthen vessels. And... Paul, again, is recognizing his weakness. I think Paul was sickly. And all of us are pretty weak individuals. I recognize I am. I do not even know how much longer I'm going to be around. You know, when you got cancer, you never can tell. And I thank God for the way he's kept me here and the way it looks now. But we have this treasure, and the Greek word is ostraka. Ostraka is what the archaeologist digs up today, broken pieces of pottery. That's all most of us are. we just sort of broken pieces of pottery. But we have this treasure. What is that? Well, that's the glorious gospel, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Now, I want you to see something. Well, I can't let you see it today. We'll have to wait till next time. But how in the world is that light that's in the vessels, how is it going to get out? Well, if you want to find out the pattern God's given us, go back and read the story of Gideon. 
And we're going to look at that tomorrow. God has to break a vessel in order for the light to get out. That's the reason some folk have to be sick, the reason Paul had a thorn in the flesh, and the reason I can't help but believe that God's using weak vessels today, not strong vessels, but weak vessels. They let the light shine out. We'll be looking at that next time. Until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved. For more great teaching in 2 Corinthians, join me this weekend for Dr. McGee's Sunday sermon titled, Something New Under the Sun. To listen or see if your station carries the Sunday sermon, visit us at ttb.org. Well, I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll meet you back here on Monday as we continue this wild and wonderful journey through the Bible. We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners, who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.